So um, any questions from last time, what we covered? We got up to the anticholinergics in terms of asthma. So say for instance, you have a patient with an acute asthma exacerbation, what's kind of your go-to med? So short acting beta agonist, what's the primary one? Albuterol, right. I need nine times out of 100 is going to be albuterol. I may have those patients every once in a while on Zopinex, but um, uh, albuterol is going to be the, the mainstay of therapy there, right? Um, anyway, so getting into another med you might use in conjunction with albuterol is going to be some of our anticholinergics. So remember, muscarinic receptors on the lungs when they're activated typically cause mucus secretion, they cause bronchoconstriction. We can reverse that by using something that blocks those receptors, right? Um, so there's short acting versions and a long acting one. The long acting is going to be more so used for COPD management. We do not use long acting anticholinergics for asthma. The short acting that we may use occasionally uh, for acute asthma exacerbation. So uh, I don't know if anyone's been like in an urgent care or an ER and they talk about a duoneb. Anyone ever heard that term before? Or combivent, perhaps. Um, that's a combination of albuterol plus the short acting anticholinergic called ipratropium. Atrovent. Most patients on the outpatient side, when they're kind of self-managing their asthma, they will not be on a short anticholinergic. Um, however, if they come into the hospital healthcare sort of arena, that's where you may see that combo given. So frequently, if we have kids showing up at the PEDS ER for an asthma exacerbation, they'll get an order for albuterol, uh, you know, say two and a half milligrams, Q15 minutes for three doses, and they'll have a separate order to go along with that. There'll be ipratropium, you know, say 500 micrograms, every 15 minutes for three doses. That way the respiratory therapist is actually combining the two in the same nebulizer and they're to bring all that in at the same time. So they're getting the beta two agonist effect which will cause that bronchodilation. They get the additional benefit of the anticholinergic kind of drawing things out, also causing some bronchodilation as well. That kind of makes sense? It's kind of attacking it from two different mechanisms there. But the long acting only gonna be used for COPD and that's teotropium. So what are the side effects of an anticholinergic? I don't know if I've mentioned this mnemonic before. Have I talked about yes. it? Yes. Okay. Remember, so um, these are very classic things you think with anticholinergics. Now, with inhaled versions, do you think you're likely to see a lot of these systemic effects? Less likely, right? Because, again, the bioavailability is not going to be super high with that. Certainly, it depends on the dose. So, for instance, if a patient is getting a huge amount that they're breathing in constantly through the nebulizer, perhaps, but these are less likely to happen there. But these are good, a good mnemonic to know. Now, what else can we use for these patients here? We talked about inhaled corticosteroids and what are their role in asthma management? They have long-term control of inflammation. They're gonna be useful because they will help prevent patients from having to come in to a healthcare setting for an acute exacerbation, presumably, right? Um, what's the big side effect you see with inhaled corticosteroids? Hmm? Is that epistaxis? Where do you normally see that? Which for uh, doses form? That's the nasal form, right? But it's good to keep that delineation here. These are inhaled corticosteroids. Thrush is the big thing, right? That's why I always want to make sure they wash their mouth out. It's because thrush is going to be a risk there. Why do, you get, why do they get thrush? Local immunosuppression, right? Right there at the back of the, the pharynx, right? Um, so we also can use oral systemic corticosteroids as well, right? So these are going to be for more severe exacerbations where they're coming into the healthcare setting uh, where we may need to help get that inflammation under control very quickly. So this will have, and, and the inhaled corticosteroids took how long to kick in? Could be weeks before it really starts to see a big effect there, right? It could be six to eight weeks potentially before you really see the full effects. Now, again, when a patient's taking that, and you're like, hey, it may not work for the first couple of weeks. They're probably not going to think the drug's all that effective, um, which is why I frequently see it in combination with the long-acting beta agonist. You get some additional benefit there. But let's say they have a more severe exacerbation. They're coming in. This is where our oral systemic corticosteroids. The downside of using systemic corticosteroids is what? more side effects, right? So, um, and again, this is short-term use. This is like maybe a five-day course of prednisone or something we're talking about here. And we've mentioned some of the corticosteroids with our ENT section before, right? Which ones did we talk about there? Which agents? Dexamethasone, prednisone, prednisolone, which is the main oral liquid formulation we'll use for children. Um, there are other ones as well we'll mention here, but um, again, the same, same ones are going to be used here, right? They all do the same thing. They're all decreasing the inflammation from the actual site of the nucleus. So it takes some hours to kick in, but this is good because it helps out with the sort of later phase of an asthma exacerbation where the patient may appear better after you give them a dose of albuterol, 
but they may have late presenting symptoms where they can come back after you discharge them, steroids are going to help prevent that. And so, as I mentioned, prednisone, prednisolone, sometimes if they require more intense treatment, if they need to, say, use something IV potentially, if they're coming in and being admitted, we'll use methylprednisolone, which is a common one. Uh, we we'll use IV parenterally. Um, dexamethasone may also either use orally or uh, intravenously as well, just depending on the situation there. And again, we know the side effects here, depending on how long they're on it for, you may find um, these side effects are more or less present. So if it's just a quick five day course here, am I so worried about the adrenal suppression? Typically no, right? I don't have to worry, really, really worry about weaning unless it's longer than a week here. Um, you know, dermal thinning, probably not with a short course like this, um, but these are all things that could happen, right? Um, certainly worrying about things like, if you have a diabetic patient, what do I worry about? Blood sugar is going to go up when you're on these medications here, right? This immunosuppression you may want to worry about. Say they have cancer treatment. Say they have HIV on top of this. Um, hypertension, right? Because what? Why does this worsen hypertension? Makes it go up, but why does it do that? We'll talk more about this in the hypertension section, but remember it's those, there's the glucocorticoid effects, which causes the glucose to, to raise up, but there's also the mineralocorticoid effects, and it holds on to water and salt in the kidneys, right? That's why you see blood pressure go up, because there's more volume that your, your vessels are holding on to, right? So those are all things you would want to think about. Um, and again, short five-day course on the outpatient side, not a big deal, but some patients they have such severe exacerbations, we have them in, say, the ICU for two weeks or something. At that point, do I have to worry about adrenal suppression? Yeah, so then I have to think about starting to wean those patients down. And so when you're looking at asthma management, again, it's a very stepwise approach. So for instance, if they only have really intermittent symptoms, say, when they go exercise, do I need to put them on, say, a long-term inhaled corticosteroid? No, right? They only need an intermittent medication for intermittent symptoms, right? If it's more persistent, though, what do you think my first-line go-to agent is going to be? A steroid's probably going to be the, the go-to there, right? So for the majority of patients, starting off with the, you know, say a low to medium dose steroid is probably going to be the most effective. They'll have that in addition to what else for quick acting? They'll still have an albuterol, um, albuterol along with that, right? So they'll have albuterol as needed. The inhaled corticosteroids are going to be scheduled, right? Um, that's an inhaler, yes, absolutely. So these are all inhaled medications we're talking about here. Now, as an alternative, you can always consider adding on some of these other things. The most common alternative they may add on would be something like a leukotriene receptor antagonist, like Montelukast or Singular is going to be the most common one, mainly because the side effects are very, very minimal, um, and the potential benefits are, again, pretty minimal as well, but they, they still could get some benefit from that. Say, for instance, the low-dose, oh, yes, ma'am. They don't have to have allergies to, to need the leukotriene antagonist. I see a lot of, and again, I'm mainly seeing children, you know, for the most part. I see a ton of kids just on, on singular because, again, a lot of times you're saying, well, I can get a little bit of benefit for relatively no side effects. So most people just put them on it anyway, right? But again, if I was looking to, say, increase compliance and minimize the amount of meds a uh, patient is on, then maybe I'll just go with the inhaled corticosteroid because I know I get more bang for my buck out of that potentially, right? Um, however, it's easier to take... A tablet than it is to have good technique and inhale medication correctly. And we'll talk about those techniques in a few minutes. But let's say the inhaled corticosteroid is not working well enough on its own, what can I do? So I could, so I could work on maximizing the dose or what could I add on to the regimen? Long acting beta, beta agonist is going to be good there, right? So like salmeterol from moderol, anything like that's going to be good. Um, let's say I have a patient who's on maximal dose and held corticosteroids. They're on max dose, long acting beta agonist. They have leukotriene receptor antagonists on board. What else could I add on at that point? Well, so say I've already maxed out the doses on those. Yeah, that's when I started to think about Zolaire, right? That's when I started to think about using that omelizumab. Again, that's sort of a last-ditch effort, so to speak, because it is more expensive. We do have side effects associated with that. They have to go into the office to actually have that administered. That's not something you do at home. Um, so that can be a big inconvenience, especially if you imagine if it's your child, you're having to take in every couple of weeks and you have a job to work, right? Or you're in PA school or something like that. So um, you can kind of consider where they're at. The test questions will be kind of similar to that. We're saying the patient's on this right now. What's going to be the next step if that's not working, right? Or there may be a new diagnosis. Here are their symptoms. I'll tell you if it's persistent or intermittent, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you their symptomatology and ask you to classify. 
if it's moderate, you know, persistent or severe persistent, because again, I'm not really into the diagnosis, so to speak. I'm into more of the treatment. So you should be able to figure out, okay, that persistent symptoms, you know, it's a new uh, diagnosis. Let me go ahead and start off with an inhaled corticosteroid, right? Along with a short acting beta agonist. And that would be a good starting point for those patients, right? Th things to consider. Now, um, the inhaled are the, the inhaled medications come in a couple different dosage forms. There's one that we call metered dose inhalers or an MDI. Anyone know what that means? Gives you a metered dose. Yeah, absolutely. So basically those are going to be the ones where you see it has a canister associated with it. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Um, and, and we'll talk about technique a little bit. And those ones, they have a propellant that is actually going to be administering the medication. That's what's causing the force of the medication to go into the respiratory tract. Okay. There's also what they call dry powdered inhalers. And those are typically, if you see like a discus medication or something where they kind of spin it open and they, they breathe that in. Um, in those cases there, the patient is providing all the force of inspiration to get that drug into the lungs, right? They have to think about like what's gonna be good for your patient in terms of can they even provide enough inspiratory force to get that drug in? They may not be able to if they're particularly old, maybe that's from restrictive lung disease, that could be really difficult for them. For kids though, we also have issues where, um, you know, when you're using an inhaler by itself, like say a meter dose inhaler, there's a lot of technique to it and a lot of dexterity, some coordination that goes into it. We have devices that can help us out to um, try to mitigate some of that. So if you ever hear about a spacer or a valve holding chamber, these are basically attachments that you would put onto the inhaler itself. And essentially it's gonna hold the medication into a canister there, such that the patient can administer the dose of the drug, it'll go into this canister, and then when they're ready to breathe it in, they can then inhale that. Yes, sir. Um, some of them just came in that dosage form. I don't know if there's a particular benefit. Um, maybe if you're worried about propellants or something like that, it gets rid of one of those, um, uh, one of those ingredients, but there's no particular benefit I'm aware of. Uh, not quite that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw a baby powder at your patients and might start coughing up and... Yeah, you would think... No, um, it's not quite, the volume is not that high, right? So you're not getting that much powder. Um, it's a relatively small amount. If you think about it, like if you crushed up a tablet, right? Like it's really not that much powder, so to speak. It's probably even less than that. So they would just inhale that. Um, you don't really see issues of it like caking the back of the throat and them choking or anything like that. That really doesn't happen. So that's a good question though, because again, if, you don't, if you've never seen one before, you don't really know. Um, but focusing more on the, the meter dose inhalers that have the actual propellant in them, the, the valve holding chambers are good because they will allow patients who may be not that, all that coordinated to be able to inhale that sort of at their own pace. Um, because otherwise it could, if they have say rheumatoid arthritis and their joints are such that they have a hard time coordinating or uh, if they're small children and they're kind of fighting you trying to get this dose into them, that could be really difficult there. The big thing with ever using these inhalers or devices, you gotta clean them off because otherwise what can happen? Yeah, fungus might start growing on it, bacteria are gonna grow on it. Like it's just a good idea just to clean them off. Cause again, these patients may be at risk for developing infections anyway. So this is something you want to, to certainly consider. So here's an example of what some of these inhalers might actually look like. Um, again, the biggest thing you wanna do whenever you're starting off by using these is to shake them up. Anyone know why? Yeah, it's a suspension. You'll find that the propellant and the drug will actually separate out. So by shaking it up, you get a nice homogenous mixture. Um, and so they can then get a good mixture of the two and breathe that in, okay? Um, and again, they're metered doses because they're giving a very specific dose every time you press that canister in. And so what we'll tell patients to do is just first start off after you shake it up by breathing all the way out, right? And then they're gonna hold the inhaler as shown. I typically recommend they just hold it in their, their mouth like that. Otherwise, uh, they tend to maybe hold it too far away and then they're not really getting in the full dose there. What they want them to do is to basically start an airstream that's gonna to allow to carry that medication into the respiratory tract. If they don't do this properly, you're gonna find that if they breathe in too quickly, it's gonna cause all the medication to go where? just on the back of the throat, right? And then they end up swallowing a lot of it. Uh, they're breathing in too slowly. They don't really get a lot of it in the respiratory tract either. And so what you tell them to do is as they start to breathe in slowly, then they wanna press down on the inhaler. So you can start to see there's some, some coordination that has to go along with this. Um, we're gonna have them press down on the inhaler. That's gonna then allow the medication to go along in the airstream down to the respiratory tract. And I kind of think about it as you guys ever seen Finding Nemo? you know, the turtles and they're in the jet stream in the water, right? It's kind of like that. You want them to kind of get into that stream so they can get into the lungs a little bit easier. And so once you do that, then you want to hold the breath in 
and typically have them count to, to count to 10. It's probably not gonna be 10 seconds exactly, but we have them count to 10 basically, um, and then they can release that breath, okay? Typically what we'll tell them to do is to give at least a couple of seconds, if not maybe a minute or so, between doses of their, say for instance, short acting beta agonist. So the dose of albuterol is typically like two puffs, two to four puffs potentially. Um, why do you think we give them some time in between doses? So you want the first dose to start to kick in. It's gonna cause that smooth muscle relaxation in the bronchioles, all right? So then it allows the second dose to do what? Get even further in, right? So you get more benefit out of using that second dose there. I'll find some patients will try to use both puffs at the same time. They don't really get as much bang for their buck out of that, right? And these things can be expensive. So we tell them, give some time in between doses. It allows the second one to work that much better, right? So uh, again, this is a chronic disease. This is gonna be something where um, long-term medications are gonna be very useful in preventing exacerbations, preventing hospitalizations, et cetera. Um, it's good to know that albuterol is really gonna only gonna be for short-term relief. So you have to be aware of that. They need to use that long-term therapy too if they have more persistent symptoms to prevent those, those uh, uh, other issues from developing there and again avoid triggers if possible you know if they know that uh, you know animals are going to be a problem for them you know maybe avoid those animals or maybe take uh, preventative steps to try to mitigate some of those issues there i know whenever i was a kid and i had to go over to my cousin's house they always had a ton of dogs and guess what every time i went I had to use my inhaler like it was just one of those things that just always happened so um but unfortunately sometimes you can't avoid all those triggers long acting medications can help to prevent a lot of those issues right anyways any questions on on asthma specifically all right, so getting into COPD, basically, I'm sorry, uh, my picture's covering up the words there, but anyway, um, basically what we're seeing with patients with COPD is this kind of progressive destruction of the lung parenchyma. Um, and generally, you're gonna find that, as opposed with asthma, where it is fully reversible in a lot of cases, here you're gonna find these symptoms may not be fully reversible, because once you've kind of destroyed the tissue, the tissue's gone, right? Um, and again, these patients immediately start showing symptoms as soon as this destruction happens. No, it's gonna be a spectrum of disease. It's gonna be a long term uh, period of time where even though their lung function is going down, we do have some reserve capacity. Um, you may find that symptomatology doesn't really start until they kind of are pretty progressive, right? And so again, that reversibility is gonna be a big issue there because they may still be symptomatic even when you have their drug treatment sort of optimized for them. So that's kind of one of the big problems you run into. Uh, the fortunate thing here is that we're gonna find all basically the same medications used in asthma that are gonna be used in COPD as well. We're just gonna use them a little differently, right? Um, so for instance, the first thing you should always do with the patient with COPD is what? If they're smoking, you should tell them to stop smoking, right? Now, is that always gonna be possible? No, right? Um, some patients will, uh, to the end of their life, they are just going to keep smoking, right? It's just something that's going to happen. I remember one patient who had COPD who was um, on oxygen and still smoking cigarettes. And unfortunately, the reason why he came into the ER was because he was cooking over a gas stove. So a gas stove plus oxygen plus a light source, guess what happened? He was, uh, did not survive that. He was quite the crispy critter when he got to us and that was very unfortunate. So, um, but again, that's just something that can happen, right? Um, anyway, so these patients here, obviously you wanna get them to stop smoking. Pulmonary complications like infection, there's a huge, huge risk for these patients as well. So we strongly recommend getting their pneumococcal uh, vaccination, getting their yearly influenza vaccination, right? Have you guys started getting your flu shots yet by any chance? So I don't know when they offer them or anything, or, or, or do you guys have to like, get them outside of school or they offer them through the hospital by any chance? They have them here? That's good. Yeah, it's nice if you have that, uh, that value add. Um, my cousin next to me, he said, yeah, I got it from the pharmacist and I felt like he like punched me like when he's actually giving it. And I was like, well, that makes more antibodies when you like really get it in there really forcefully. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, so again, we're hitting that season, right? We're starting to think about things like um, having like flu, you know, visitor restrictions in hospitals to prevent spread of flu, people are getting vaccinated now because the winter months are gonna be where that's more prominent, right? So anyway, so getting into other drug treatment for these patients here, we're gonna find that the single short acting inhaled bronchodilator is gonna be useful for these patients. Um, again, for intermittent symptoms, albuterol inhalers are typically gonna be your go-to, right? So albuterol is gonna be used very similarly in asthma as it will be for COPD, okay? Um, next, you can start to consider using more of a long-term inhaled bronchodilator. So this is where a long-acting beta agonist may be used by itself. Now, do we use that for asthma by itself? 
who actually did not. Long-acting beta agonists are not recommended by themselves in asthma. They've actually found increased mortality because of that, right? So whereas with asthma, you always want to go inhale corticosteroid first. For these patients, for long-term therapy, long-acting beta agonists may be recommended before that, okay? Again, you can use a combination of a beta agonist plus an anticholinergic. So for instance, they may be on teotropium, long-acting anticholinergic plus trimoterol, right? That may be a combination you'll see there. Um, you're also going to see eventually you'll consider, you know, theophylline is something I probably wouldn't consider in a lot of patients unless they're very stable and they were kind of not really responding to many other therapies there. Theophylline I mentioned very, very briefly because it's a pretty old school medication and we don't really use it for asthma too frequently anymore. Um, but more often than not, you're probably going to see them being on the inhaled corticosteroid plus the beta agonist, again, helping to control that inflammation at that point. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot we can do for those patients, right? Um, because again, their reversibility is going to be limited because they're just destroying the lungs themselves, right? So what could I ultimately do for the patient? I could give them new lungs, but again, that can be a pretty tough sell for a lot of patients. So um, the other big thing is obviously going to be oxygen is also going to be a big therapy for them uh, to consider, again, the, kind of outside of my purview, um, but oxygen is also going to really help out with that um, symptom relief for those patients as well, okay? So, yes, sir. Uh, that's just saying the one medication, right? So just a single agent. So probably just like albuterol is going to be the most common one. Yeah. So how do we get people to stop smoking? What do we do for them? Did you just say stop smoking is bad for you? Does that work? Maybe one in a million patients that'll work. Be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea this was bad for me. <laughs> hmm? A question is like, what about e-cigarettes? Are they as bad or are they worse than regular cigarettes? What do you think? We don't know yet. That's a very good answer. We have, we have no... No flipping clue. Like we have no idea because um, we are certainly seeing that with uh, you know is there a lot of regulation for the e-cigarettes? No, nah, there's like almost none. So the problem there is is that we don't know really what they're inhaling. Um, we don't know what the long-term ramifications of the stuff that they are inhaling are. There's things like um, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, all kinds of different chemicals that are in there. We just don't know what they're going to do. I had a call to the poison center the other day where an ER doc had this relatively young guy coming in. He was using a Juul. You guys are familiar with Juuls? It's kind of like a common brand name for, for some e-cigarettes, and it's very popular with a lot of high school kids. Um, and so maybe older kids as well, but Jules are really big in high schools. But um, so anyway, this guy was coming in relatively young, early 20s, but basically the, the chest x-ray was like totally whited out. He's just been had this history of using a Juul previously. Um, you know, shortness of breath, dyspnea, but no fever, no white count. And again, when you see that lungs that look like that, you probably think like pneumonia, but the doc was like, yeah, it just doesn't, like the patient otherwise is not presenting. There's no purulent sputum, no fever, no white count. You know, what do we do with this patient there, right? And fortunately, you know, what, what, what do I say to them? I don't know. Like, we don't have any good, you know, they're like, do we do antibiotics? Do we do this? I was like, well, they probably don't need antibiotics, right? Because it's probably not going to be an infectious cause here. Um, but we can treat them supportively, right? So you try to use things like bronchodilators and see how that works. Maybe steroids are going to be right for that patient. You know, if they're not improving in the ER, what do you do? Admit them for observation, right? Make them the hospital's problem potentially, right? So again, that's the that's the thing you have to consider there is like we don't know what the long-term ramifications are. Are there cancer risks with this stuff? I don't know, right? Are there cancer risks with certainly with traditional cigarettes and cigars? Absolutely right. So we do know some of these things in terms of uh, what they're using. That's why you want to ask the history, like, you know, what are you using? How are you using it? How often, etc. cetera. Um, the e-cigarettes, are they still just as addictive as other forms? Right, doesn't yeah. So it depends, you know, like what kind of doses are they getting? But certainly, we know that if they contain nicotine, are they addictive? Yeah, hundred percent, right? So those are things we have to consider as well as the fact that they are simply still going to be addictive. Um, but again, how, how are the doses are they getting? How does it compare to traditional cigarettes and cigars? Who could say, right? Anyway, um, but we do know that smoking leads to a lot of these cases of COPD. Now, do you think the e-cigarettes are going to be as likely to cause COPD as traditional cigarettes? I'm probably going to say less likely. And the reason why I would say that is because when you're thinking about burning a cigarette or a cigar, you're breathing a lot, a lot of really hot gas, right? Typically, when you're having these vaping devices, they're not really, um, the, the temperature's not nearly the same. So there's also like thermal damage you're doing in, in, along with a lot of the other um, destructive chemicals and carcinogens and things like that you find in traditional um, cigarettes and whatnot. So there's probably some less risk, I would assume, with that. But again, long term, we have just no clue there. But um, Anyway, so in terms of getting back to smoking cessation, what can we do for these patients here? What kind of offer, like, what, is there anything we can do in terms of like pharmacologic treatment? Yeah, so we say patches, patches of what? 
nicotine, right? So again, replacement therapy is going to be a big thing here. So again, this is where some of your va vaping devices can be useful because if it's used correctly, some patients can help to get them off of their traditional cigarettes or their cigars, wherever they happen to use, right? Um, however, we do know that they can be limited in utility if used by themselves. Obviously, combining this with some sort of like cognitive behavioral therapy is always going to help enhance the, the efficacy here, right? So you want to use kind of a uh, um, multiple sort of mechanisms here. And again, like just think, even think about smoking, like there's the physical sensation of it. I remember I had this um, this chemistry professor in college, and I think he's, uh, I think Healy must have been named after him. He was so old, and his name was Dr. Healy. I always remember that guy. Um, but I mean, he must have been like 110, still teaching chemistry, but he always held his chalk in his hand like this. Like he just had that cigarette sort of um, uh, hold to it. And he's just a long-term smoker. You can tell just by his voice, the way he's hacking up his lungs half the time during lecture, but like you just tell he's a long-term smoker, but there's a physical manifestation there. So sometimes by having something like an e-cigarette that they can still get that physical sensation that can help get them off of their cigarettes potentially, right? So replacement therapy is going to be a big thing we're going to, we're going to focus on. There's other things you can do as well. Um, certainly we mentioned patches and gums and inhalers. There's different nicotine varieties that we can use here, um, but we're also going to find that there's some other medications we'll mention here briefly. So the first one here is going to be bupropion. Anyone know what we normally use bupropion for? We actually use this for depression, right? Depression, not usually for anxiety, but mainly for depression. We'll talk about this a lot more when we get into the psych meds next semester. Um, but basically what you're finding is that why do we get addicted to things? Like what's the actual neurotransmitter responsible for that? Dopamine. dopamine, right? So like when you have a big juicy hamburger that stimulates dopamine, you say, I want more of those hamburgers, right? If you have heroin, stimulates the dopamine receptors, you say, I really want more heroin. Nicotine does the same thing. So what's interesting is that bupropion actually helps to uh, kind of reset the, the handling of dopamine in the brain. And actually you're also seeing uh, bupropion being used for other addictive disorders as well. So like eating disorders, like things like um, overeating disorders, you're seeing bupropion being used for that, helping with weight loss, seeing it used for smoking cessation, and basically because it's helping to re-regulate how dopamine is being issued out, how it's being doled out in our brains, right? I'm not going to get much more into the details than that. We'll talk more about that later on in the psych section, but just know that it's mainly affecting dopamine to help, help kind of interrupt the cycle of this reward pathway being activated by these cigarettes here. And so, um, the thing you have to consider as well is like, can patients still smoke when they're using these other medications? Is it going to be a problem? So for this one here specifically, do you think adding nicotine on top of this drug is it going to be an issue? Not necessarily, right? Because they're not really doing the same thing. You're going to see that's not going to be the case when we talk about the replacement therapies. You don't want patients smoking while they're having a patch on board because what's going to happen for them? Way too much nicotine, right? So you can see nicotine toxicity from that. In this case here, it's okay if they fall off the wagon and they smoke a cigarette because it's not going to directly interfere with the medication itself, right? So that's one of the things we're going to see with that. It's okay if they end up um, having uh, you know, a bad day, smoke a cigarette, it's not going to be the end of the world for them. You do want to be careful with bupropion in patients with seizure disorders, because this could be a risk for them to develop um, worsening seizures, could lower that threshold there. Um, we'll, not talk, we'll talk more about MAOIs later on, so don't worry so much about that one, but certainly any patients taking any other medications for depression, like a tricyclic antidepressant, things like venlafaxine, any other antidepressants may interact with bupropion. You don't want them to be on the two at the same time, okay? So nicotine replacement agents are certainly available. Those are probably the, the most kind of tried and true ones out there. Um, your bupropion is prescription only, but can you get nicotine replacements without a prescription? Yeah, you can go out there and buy nicotine gum. You can buy all kinds of nicotine replacements. There's no problem uh, over the counter there. Um, what is the purpose of using a nicotine replacement? So it helps with the titration, but if you, why do people not, why does it not work when you quit nicotine cold turkey? You get withdrawal effects, right? So they feel miserable when they stop taking it because they're so, their body's so used, to, that's their new homeostasis, right? They're used to having that nicotine around. You get withdrawal effects from that, they feel miserable, and then they go back to get that fi fix of nicotine, right? So by giving them replacement therapy, the idea is you can help to stay off that withdrawal symptoms and then gradually titrate them down as they kind of get used to those new smaller and smaller doses over a long period of time. It's maybe months, it could be years in some cases. Uh, this is going to help them to get them off it, right? Now, again, they will see that uh, for some patients, they like to do like an initial trial of say six to 12 weeks, but for some people, it may take even longer than that. It just really depends on, on the case there. Um, again, a lot of the ones are available over the counter, like the patches and the gum for sure. Um, but be careful, you know, with things like gums, who do, you, who do you think might accidentally get into that? 
little kids, right? And like nicotine can be really nasty for, for little kids, especially if they are relatively naive to the effects of the chemical, right? You can certainly see some side effects with that. And again, you have to let them know, do not consume nicotine along with these agents here because you're going to see that toxicity. So you can see things like hypertension. You can see things like arrhythmias develop here. You can see seizures potentially in some rare cases. So again, be careful with mixing these two together. If they're on the patch and they decide they want to go ahead and smoke a cigarette, like have them take the patch off. They don't need that extra nicotine, right? <laughs> now, there's another one here, Veriniclin or Chantix. This one's kind of the most novel and new of the groups here. Um, this is actually a partial nicotine receptor agonist. So it's only going to activate the receptor partially, and so what do you think it does for withdrawal symptoms? It'll help to minimize it. It'll certainly not get rid of it completely. What would happen if someone decided to smoke a cigarette while they're on this medication? This actually ends up binding to it tighter than nicotine would, so it actually prevents that nicotine from interacting with those receptors. So actually what they would recommend, we'll talk about the dosing here in a second, um, they'll say that you start one week before your quit date. So start this medication so that way they're still smoking while they're on this. It's okay because this is only partially activating those receptors and kind of displacing the nicotine from those receptors. And then you'll continue, continue 12 weeks after the, the stop date. Right, so the point is is to help minimize those withdrawal symptoms and hopefully prevent them from uh, relapsing. And then after 12 weeks or so, hopefully they can come off of it completely and they should be good to go. Okay, um, pretty well tolerated. The one thing you will note, this is very unique for Vernaclin, is it causes um, significant, significant increase in vivid dreams. Right, so if you ever hear someone who's taken Chantix before? That's the one thing they always talk about. Is like, man, I had the freakiest dreams. They were so real. And for some people, it's freaky enough. They just say, I just don't want to take it at all. Some people is totally fine. It just depends. Um, but you could see potentially some issues in terms of black box warnings they've issued for it, things like depression. So worsening depression could be a risk there. Suicidal ideations. So again, let your patients know that, you know, have people around them watch for these symptoms. Notice that they seem more depressed than usual if they have a history of depression. You got to watch out for that because it could be a reason to stop taking the medication entirely, right? So uh, as I mentioned with immunizations, you want to get them their pneumococcal because they tend to be at bigger risk for developing infections with strep pneumo. And then also your yearly influenza is highly, highly recommended for those patients there. Right. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so if they're on replacement therapy and they're getting an additional dose of nicotine on what they would normally get, certainly GI symptoms can be a thing you could see with that, right? Because you think nicotine, nicotine acts on what kind of receptors? Anyone? Acetylcholine receptors, right? Because there are nicotinic receptors there. Well, there can be some bleed over effects. I imagine it can affect your stomach as well, right? So you know the muscarinic receptors are located on the GI tract. Um, but yeah, nicotine itself it can just be rough on the stomach, so. So it's different, right? So when you're using a nicotine replacement therapy, you're just adding more nicotine onto the pile, right? So if they were to smoke and then also use a patch or something, you're just adding more onto the pile, you're gonna get more effect out of, that, out of that drug, right? Versus if I have a partial agonist like Chantix on board, if they say they have a relapse and they smoke on top of the medication there, what's good about that is that it actually will, um, it'll be occupying a lot of those nicotine receptors and only partially activating them. So you don't really see the same kind of increase in the effect as you would with a simple replacement. Okay, so it's kind of the difference between the two there. Okay. So it's kind of the same. I mentioned, I know I mentioned this back in the pharmacodynamic, uh, like the intro to farm uh, course there, but remember we talked about bupropion, um, uh, uh, buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. Anyone remember that? So anyway, we kind of do the same thing for opioid addiction. So for instance, with anyone ever heard of methadone before? Like methadone is like a full opioid agonist. So if they end up using going back to heroin on top of methadone, that's a big problem because you're going to see a lot of respiratory depression. They're using buprenorphine, which is only a partial agonist, and they use heroin on top of that. It's mitigated because a lot of the receptors are already bound up, and it's only getting a partial agonist sort of effect there. So kind of the similar sort of um, uh, kind of paradigm we're thinking there. Any other questions? If not, oh, yes, ma'am. Um, it depends, right? So I'll tell you things like the mast cell stabilizers are not used very commonly. Um, they don't really get that much additional benefit out of those. Leukotriene receptor antagonists are probably the most common one you're going to use as an alternative. You're going to add that on to, say, their long-acting beta agonists and corticosteroid. Uh, that's probably the most common thing you do there. So 
Um, well, it could be. All right, so it depends on how what their symptomatology is like. So, you know, is it to the point where are they still waking up in the middle of the night having asthma attacks, right? So that obviously is not very well controlled. Or how often they haven't used their short acting beta agonist. They're still using it four or five times a week. Again, that's a sign that things are not well controlled. So the question is, like, do you want to up the dose of the steroid they're on or do you want to add on another agent, right? I'd probably say, well, just maximize the dose of the medication you're on because I typically go towards fewer medications rather than more, right? Uh, but it depends on who you're dealing with, what the patient's like, what they feel comfortable with. Some people are really worried about steroids, right? So if you have a young kid and they're worried about the, the growth potential, right? I think some studies have shown it's only been like a centimeter overall may impact your height, but that centimeter may be a lot for some people, right? Who could say? If, you're, if you would have been six feet even, or five feet minus, you know, one less centimeter. Maybe that makes a difference to you. I have no idea, but it depends on the patient. Any other questions? If not, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back and we'll start the cardio section. Um, any questions from the first half that came up in the break? All right, I have a couple of questions on the sticky board here. Would a nicotine replacement still give a buzz if you get a big enough dose, perhaps? Um, now think about the onset of action, for instance. So with a inhaled medication, is that pretty fast onset? Well, think about the blood flow, right? So the medication being absorbed from the lungs into the bloodstream, where does that blood in the lungs go to next? Back to the heart, left side of the heart, and then to where? To the brain, right? Versus, say, if I were to give, say, a transdermal patch, what do you think in terms of the onset of action is for that? Pretty slow, right? Because that's to go through the skin, get into the venous side of things, and then eventually get up to the brain. Much slower, right? Uh, how about for like a uh, Nicorette gum or something where they're having some mucosal absorption of that? Yeah, probably faster than the patch, but probably slower than an inhaled formulation, right? So again, they may not be able to get that same sort of strong buzz, but certainly if they're using like an e-cigarette or something, and they're getting a big enough dose, yeah, you can probably still see that same sort of effect you can see with that, right? So that's certainly, um, a lot of it has to do with the dosage form that you're getting uh, with that, okay? Um, let's see, could you please uh, be able to give different scenario uh, tests like questions or how to approach the stepwise process to treat asthma? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it'll probably be, for instance, I'm trying to think of any other case examples here. You know, like I said, it just is going to be based off of that stepwise approach to where if a patient's not being well controlled, if they're coming in, right? Because I'm not going to ask a question. When a patient comes in and their symptoms are totally controlled and they never have to use a short acting beta agonist, what do you do? Your answer would be, well, do nothing. Like, I just, you know, they're well controlled. Like, I'm going to give you a problem to solve, right? So they're going to come in and they're on max dose inhaled corticosteroid. They're on a long acting beta agonist. They're on singular. What do you do next, right? They're still having. You know, since they're still waking up multiple times at night throughout the month, what do you do? Well, then maybe Zolaire is a good option for that patient, right? Um, maybe we'll say something like, you know, they have, I'm trying to think of any other cases, you know, contraindications for things. You know, say they're coming in, the mom's really worried about starting steroids in her young child. What might be a good alternative agent to start? Probably singular. Probably singular is a good option to try it for that kind of a patient, right? So you know, I'll give you options there. I'll give you uh, choices to make. You know, I may put something like a long-acting beta agonist on there by itself as an option. And would you ever choose that for asthmatic patient? No, you wouldn't do that, right? I may put teotropium on there, long-acting anticholinergic. Would that ever be an option for asthma? No, you wouldn't do that, right? So again, there'll be things on there that you would never use in asthma. There'll be things there that may be ineffective. So for instance, if a patient's on max dose inhaled corticosteroids or on a long acting beta agonist and they're still having severe symptoms, um, do you think a leukotriene receptor antagonist is gonna be the thing that fixes them? Probably not, right? So again, that would not be a correct answer in that case there. So those are the kind of things I want you to think about in terms of the stepwise approach, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, if you're bupropion, if they can get addicted to it, is it not considered a controlled medication? So you, uh, bupropion itself has no addictive properties, so it doesn't actually stimulate release of dopamine like you would say something like, you know, a dose of cocaine or something, right? Um, what it does is actually it helps to regulate the levels of dopamine such that when you have that 
uh, say the dose of nicotine hitting your system, you don't really get that same surge of dopamine like you normally would from it, right? So it helps to re kind of reset that reward pathway to hopefully prevent um, patients from having that desire to go and get more of whatever it is they happen to be addicted to, if that makes sense, right? We actually don't know the full mechanism for why it works. We just know that helping to um, uh, kind of reset that reward pathway tends to be effective uh, for, for these addictive sort of um, conditions which is why you can use it for overeating disorder. We can use it for uh, nicotine addiction. They may say use it for other things in the future, potentially. Any other questions? If not, let's start with uh, cardio. You guys saw it up on Canvas? I see good, okay. All right, so we've, we've got a lot of cardio drugs to cover. It turns out the heart uh, is quite important. Who knew, right? Um, but let's get into it. Let's talk about our medications for lipid lowering uh, therapy. So why do we care about lipids in the bloodstream? Why does it matter? Or cholesterol? Yeah, it can lead to atherosclerosis. Why is that a problem? Because eventually it's going to block off some coronary arteries and then what happens? Yeah, get an MI and then you die, right? So again, this is why we, we care about this. So um, we're going to see that there's kind of two primary sources for our dietary fats, right? So we have dietary fat and cholesterol coming in uh, to our diet. And we're going to see that not only is it effective just to say, I mean, because you could cut a lot of fat out of a person's diet, a lot of cholesterol out of a person's diet, but is that automatically going to mean they have low LDL cholesterol? No, right? Why, why is that? A lot of it happens to be genetic, and in fact, you're going to find there's a bigger influence from genetics than you do just from their diet, okay? The body can regulate how much of the stuff it's absorbing. It can affect how much it's getting from the diet. However, your genetics are your genetics. You can't really change that. And so if you're predisposed to producing a ton of extra cholesterol, if you're predisposed to not being able to process it very well, you're just going to have high cholesterol, right? So this is where our medications come into play. So obviously, we're going to have some amount of our uh, fats coming in through the diet. It's going to be absorbed from the intestine. I think I'm not going to get super big on the details. I'm just going to cover the salient points that where our medications are uh, involved here. Um, but so we have the the intestines where we're getting some absorption. Also, where's the other big place that a lot of our cholesterol is made? It's going to be the liver. The liver is the other primary organ we're going to be focusing on here in terms of processing, uh, producing, and getting rid of cholesterol in the bloodstream. Okay, because what do we use cholesterol for? We use fatty acids, hormones, we produce hormones from cholesterol and other fatty acids, right? What else do we do? How about all of your cell membranes are made up of those phospholipid bilayers? Those are based off triglycerides and fatty acids and things like that, right? So we're going to find that we utilize a lot of these for a lot of important cell processes. So it's important to have cholesterol floating around, but we don't want too much of it because that's where you have the disbalance. You see plaque formation, you see all the inflammation, all kinds of problems. Anyway, so what we're going to see is that when you ingest these cholesterols and you absorb them from the intestine, you're going to form what they call these chylomicrons. As we're going to see, it's going to be kind of a balance between a lot of triglycerides and then some cholesterol esters as we're going to see. And then there's going to be an important enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which is going to be involved in the processing of a lot of these fatty acids and things like that. Some of these are going to get taken up into the adipose tissue, as we know. Um, some of these are going to get taken up in the peripheral tissues. Right? This is primarily going to be uh, one of the big receptors we're going to talk about is the LDL receptor. It's also going to be a really important one. Um, however, most of this is going to get eventually delivered over into the liver. Okay. From there, what happens is the liver can utilize those triglycerides, it can utilize those fatty acids, you know, all those um, uh, components there. And then eventually it's going to spit out what they call VLDL. Okay. Anyone know what that stands for? very low density lipoprotein. This is mainly where you're going to get most of your triglycerides. Like if you measure a lipid panel on a patient, this is the primary thing you're measuring in terms of your triglycerides. You're getting that, that LD, uh, VLDL count there. Okay. Um, that'll be important when we're talking about medications and how they're actually going to be affecting the different components of a lipid profile, right? Because we care about our, our triglycerides. What else are we looking at in terms of like if you like order a lipid panel on a patient? LDL and the HDL, right? Those are kind of the, the big things we're going to be focusing on, at least for, for my purposes here. So anyway, so those triglycerides and those LD, VLDL particles are going to get sent out into the bloodstream. And as you are going to find, as lipoprotein lipase kind of works on it and is utilizing those free fatty acids to go to the adipose tissue or the cells, wherever they're going to go to, eventually you're going to get this product called intermediate density lipoprotein. But eventually what we care about is this LDL here, the low density lipoprotein. And low density lipoprotein is good or bad cholesterol? It's a bad cholesterol. That's what leads to a lot of the atherosclerosis and whatnot. It's what's going to lead to, um, you see a lot of peripheral tissue uptake of this stuff. Not great. Okay. Anyway, well, how do we get rid of LDL 
from the bloodstream. Well, some of it gets uptaken into the cells, but the other big place it's gonna be focusing on is the liver. The liver has LDL receptors on it that will then uptake the LDL into it. And then you can see it can process it because not only does it produce cholesterol and triglycerides that go into the bloodstream, but also our bile acids, right? Our bile acids are made off of those components as well. And what do bile acids do for us? Yeah, they help. Yeah, they break down fats into smaller particles so we can actually absorb them and form those chylomicrons. And if you notice here, this kind of the circular pattern here. This is called enterohepatic recirculation. So a lot of the bile salts that we spit out into the GI tract, that's what we do with them. We can reabsorb them, right? Because the body wants to reuse, reduce, and recycle, right? It wants to make use of what it has. Um, you're going to see that there's a lot of these steps here already that we can interfere with in order to affect our cholesterol levels within the body, as we're going to see here, okay? So anyway, so this is an important concept, this enterohepatic recirculation that happens here, this uptake of LDL into the liver here, and then the liver is actually producing things like VLDL and eventually LDL from itself, okay? We'll talk more about the details on that in a second. Um, but again, triglycerides, cholesterol, this is primarily, we're, we're seeing a lot of these fats being taken up from our diet, and this is what gets incorporated into those chylomicrons, as I mentioned. As you might imagine here, seeing this come into the GI tract, again, these are usually large particles that they can get broken down by the bile acids. We're going to see here there's already some me medications that can uh, interfere with this process here, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these small particles are then going to get absorbed and eventually get turned into those chylomicrons, okay? So, for instance, what would happen, say, if I had a medication that bound up, say, the bile acids that were being sent out by the liver? What would happen? You just poop them right out, right? You just eliminate them from the feces, and that is one way we can reduce cholesterol, right? What would happen if I say block this cholesterol transporter? You just get eliminated in the feces, right? So we're already going to see there's several different places where we can interfere with this process here, right? So anyway, so again, looking at this transport of dietary or exogenous fat from the intestine here, you're going to find that there's a balance between um, triglycerides, you can see is going to be the green component here, and then the cholesterol esters is the yellow component. Um, so friends like triglycerides can go on to eventually become like part of the cell membranes. You can find the cholesterol esters tend to form things like um, uh, steroids and things like that. Um, but basically, you're going to see here as it gets uptaken to the liver, the VLDLs will get uh, sent out. And then as lipoprotein lipase works on those components, what do you notice about the concentrations here? You get rid of a lot of the triglycerides. And again, as I mentioned, when you measure a lipid profile, this is where you're getting a lot of that triglyceride count from, is from the VLDL particles. So as you metabolize more and more of that stuff off, as you oxidize it, eventually the LDL, which is mostly just cholesterol esters at that point, then get uptaken into the liver through the actions of the LDL receptor. That's gonna be an important component we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, obviously, some HDL is gonna be formed as well, and HDL is our Good cholesterol, we like HDL, it tends to be protective from a cardiovascular standpoint. We'll also see some of this will end up being formed um, and it will also interfere with the liver as well. Some medications are really good at dropping triglyceride counts. Some medications are good at focusing on raising HDL. Some are good at lowering LDL. We'll look at the different components there. So, and again, kind of looking at the, the ratios here between triglycerides and cholesterol, you can kind of see um, how as, as more metabolism occurs here, eventually you're going to get to LDL, where it's mostly just the cholesterol esters at that point. Um, no, here, this is a really important component. There's a protein on the surface of those LDL particles that gets uptaken by the LDL receptor, okay? Some people may have difference in genetics where they may not express some of these proteins quite so well, and that can lead to really high cholesterol levels, as you're going to see. Uh, but this is the main thing we're going to be focusing on for a lot of our medications. Okay. So, um, looking at this, you're going to find that the LDL receptor is responsible for about 75% of the clearance of the LDL particles from the liver. So if you imagine kind of the negative feedback loop, if your liver has a lot of cholesterol already in it and it has as much as it needs, do you think it expresses more or less LDL receptors? Less, because it's like, I got enough, I don't need to really worry about that. Well, what if I were to interrupt the process and say I deplete the liver of a lot of cholesterol particles and triglycerides, what do you think it would do to the LDL receptors at that point? It would upregulate them, right? And so that's going to be a primary principle we're going to see with a lot of our medications is by interfering with the liver's ability to produce things like VLDL and eventually LDL particles, it's going to be expressing more of the LDL receptors, and that's going to cause more of that to be cleared from the blood, okay? So keep that principle in mind because you're going to find many medications are going to help with that. If you have less of the receptor activity, more LDL particle accumulation happens in the bloodstream, and then eventually where does it deposit? into the endothelium, that's where you're going to see the plaque start to form, and eventually you can find that's where your coronaries get blocked up, and then boom, now you have a heart attack, right? 
And so you imagine here is an LDL recept or LDL molecule. Here's the ApoB100 protein that resides on the cell surface there, and here's the LDL receptor on the hepatocyte. Once this interacts with it, it kind of engulfs this particle. What's that process called? Right, endocytosis, right? So it kind of engulfs it. And then you're going to see it can then be utilized for things like amino acids and cholesterol, whatever it needs to be done for. And then eventually you're going to find the recycling of that receptor back to the cell surface. Okay. Now, again, if the liver has a ton of cholesterol already in it, it doesn't really need to express a lot of those receptors, so it'll, they'll stay internal. Versus if we can interrupt the process, you're going to find more of these receptors at the surface, which means more of it cleared from the blood, which means less atherosclerosis, right? Less particle accumulation in, in the endothelium. So here's where the different medications are going to be utilized to interrupt this process and cause lower serum cholesterol levels, right? So we're going to see that our statins are playing a role within the liver itself. We're going to find things that block uptake from the GI tract. We're going to find things that block our resins from being reabsorbed. Several different processes here, which are going to be very useful uh, for getting our cholesterol in check, okay? We'll talk about all those in more detail. Um, here are the different classes we're going to talk about specifically. Like, we have our statins, uh, cholesterol inhibitors, all those kind of things. Yes, ma'am? the ApoB100 protein. So that's what's on the surface of the LDL particle, and that's what interacts with the receptor. So it's the key for the lock that is the LDL receptor, essentially. Okay. And if you had a problem expressing that, say, for instance, your genetics were such, maybe you didn't express that protein as well, then you'd have less keys, and less, less of it can get into the liver itself, right? So the LDL would build up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then your liver's trying to produce more of it. It's not being uptaken from the blood, and then boom, yeah, you can see that. Okay, so let's talk about our statins first. So I'll tell you, uh, yes ma'am? This one? Um, which one are you talking about? Yes, this picture? Yes. Yep. Oh, they didn't show up? That's okay, we're going to talk more about them in, in detail. Yeah, so that's interesting. I don't know why they show up. Maybe if you go into presenter mode, maybe it'll show up. Did you guys work on the same PowerPoint I am? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's your computer. I can't tell. I don't know. Yeah, just check with your friends, maybe. Yeah, that'd be fine. Or go to my YouTube channel, like, comment, and subscribe, and you can see the boxes yourself. Okay. Um, so getting into the statins, you're going to find that this is by far, far and away, the most important class of the drugs we're going to talk about in this section here, okay? So put three asterisks next to this one because this is the most important ones we're going to deal with, okay? So we have several statins we're going to deal with because this is kind of like a blockbuster set of medications when they're coming out. So everyone said, well, I don't want to have one of those two because we can make some money off of this. So uh, how can you tell if it's a statin drug? Yeah. Ends with statin. Easy enough, right? But the actual mechanism, the actual classification is going to be this HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor. Now, because that's a mouthful, we just call them statins, right? But it's important to know that's how they actually work. They're blocking this enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And so what's happening basically is by interrupting that enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, you prevent the liver, the actual hepatocytes, from producing cholesterol. Okay? What this does is, and you can imagine here's a hepatocyte and here's the systemic circulation, by lowering cholesterol synthesis, you're going to cause intracellular cholesterol levels to do what? They'll go down, right? Because you have less of it being produced here, which means we're going to be making more LDL receptors on the cell surface because if the intracellular component of cholesterol is low, it says, well, I need to get more of it. Where's it going to get it from? From the bloodstream. So it's going to have more of those receptors there. Huh? It's called upregulation. Yeah, those receptors there for sure. And so in, uh, in turn, you're also going to see levels of VLDL actually drop as well because less of it's being produced in those hepatocytes. VLDL goes down. So which component of your lipid panel goes down? Triglycerides are going to go down, right? So you're going to see some good effects on your triglycerides actually go down. <clears throat> and so you're going to see that LDL cholesterol is going to go down, VLDL is going to go down, so triglycerides go down. And then you're also going to see eventually some increase, some modest increases in HDL cholesterol as well, okay? All really great things for helping to get those cholesterol levels in check. However, what you're going to find nowadays is that if you look at the guidelines, we'll talk about those later, we don't really care so much about what the numbers are anymore. We used to really focus on the numbers and getting you down to certain levels. Nowadays, we more care about what the risk factors are for the patient for developing cardiovascular disease. And so this is where we like statins because they have, uh, and this is a very fancy term you can use for all your friends to wow them, we like them for the pleiotropic effects. And pleiotropic 
Anyone know what that word means by any chance? I'd like to say that it basically means there's additional sort of sort of side benefits to it that aren't really directly related to its mechanism of action. So these are the side benefits of kind of the, the fringe benefits of having a statin on board, which is why we like these patients to be on statins first and foremost for anyone with that risk for cardiovascular disease, okay? So some of the things it's gonna do, well, it can help with stabilizing atherosclerotic plaques. We like that because why? They don't break off, they don't break off and eventually cause an embolus, right, in the coronary vessel, great. Um, it helps to decrease platelet effects. Why do we care about that? Platelets are another big component of those clots that form, right, around those plaques that break off. So less platelet activity, thus you're gonna keep those vessels um, with blood flowing through them, they're gonna stay patent for longer. No, actually, so again, this, this is a nice thing. You don't really see those effects. Um, it's, it's a mild effect, but it's an additional. But so you take all these together. Hmm? No, I wouldn't. The effects are not that strong, right? So again, you still want someone to like be on aspirin, potentially. But um, those, again, these are just all the little tiny, tiny benefits you get from this, but they all kind of add up to big effects overall, right? Um, they have some okay effects on blood pressure. They can help with um, decreasing inflammatory markers. Basically, they're doing all these things together, meaning that when you have patients who are on statins alone, you tend to find um, that even if you compared them to other people, say on different classes of antilipemics, and they had similar LDL concentrations, you tend to find these patients still have reduced mortality as compared to them, right? So overall, your patients are living for longer because they're on a statin, essentially, okay? And it's due to a lot of these pleiotropic effects, not just specifically on getting your LDL down to a, a certain number, okay? And so don't get scared by this table here. The main thing I want you to focus on, though, is that by comparing these different statins together, you're going to see some differences. Uh, the big thing I want you to focus on is going to be the metabolism section here, right? The majority of these are going to be metabolized through the liver, and it's important to know how that actually occurs there. So what do you kind of notice here in terms of metabolism? Are there any notable enzymes that are on there? CYP3A4, yes. So for instance, things like atorvastatin, things like simvastatin are metabolized through CYP3A4. That means they're at risk for drug interactions, right, which can lead to toxicity. We'll talk about what those toxicities are in a moment. Um, some notable ones that don't really have a lot of drug interactions to really worry about would be something like rosuvastatin or something like pravastatin, okay? So this is an important consideration when you're deciding who, what statin to put a patient on. Are there risks for drug interactions, right? Because there could be other medications that could be severely affecting these levels here. Could be increasing the risk for toxicity. Um, it may lead you to choose something one over another, okay? Of course, I'll tell you, based off of this one, what do you think most of my students typically, what's their go-to statin based off this list here? Or suvastatin, because they're like, I don't have to think about it, I don't have to worry about it, right? But that may not always be possible for your patients. Why is that? It could be more expensive, right? What else? Maybe they don't tolerate it very well and they have a lot of side effects from it, right? So there's going to be some other issues with it. So it's easy to think, okay, I'm always going to go with because I don't have to worry about drug interactions. But clinically, that may not always be the most feasible option for your patient there, okay? Yes, sir. It's a um, uh, urinal gluconotransferase. Uh, it's another enzyme system, but not one that is super relevant in terms of drug interactions. That's why I didn't really focus on it too much. It's another kind of phase two uh, pathway there. But anyway, so looking at the side effects here, you're gonna find that um, common ones you're gonna run into includes a lot of like GI intolerance. You can see some flu-like symptoms. And this is important in terms of monitoring parameters is you have to look for their liver enzyme because uh, they can bump for these patients here. Um, this is also a dose-dependent effect. So as you drive the dose up higher, you're going to see more likelihood of their LFTs rising up, right? So this is why you want to, you know, get an initial set of LFTs early before you start medication therapy, and then you usually follow up with them. Say four, eight weeks, 12 weeks later, try to follow up to see what their LFTs look like at that point, right? Um, it's rare that these drugs by themselves cause significant hepatotoxicity, but the problems are if you have a drug interaction that comes about, or if they're particularly elderly and they're on too high of a dose, you're running that risk of, of developing these issues here, okay? Typically, you can get around this either by reducing the statin dose or just discontinuing altogether, okay? Other things we worry about, things like myalgias, things like myopathies, certainly they can have some muscle aches associated with the statins. The myopathies are fairly rare, but it could lead all the way to cases of things like rhabdomyolysis, which is what? How do patients present with rhabdomyolysis? Severe muscle pain. They're like, oh, I felt like I ran a marathon and I was just sitting on the couch all day yesterday. What else? What color would their urine turn? 
dark brown color, almost like cola or tea because of all the myoglobin they're releasing from the muscle. Um, and that can lead to things like renal failure, right? All that myoglobin precipitates out in the kidneys and then all of a sudden they're clogged up and not working so well anymore. So these are things we really worry about. So obviously if a patient developed rhabdo, should you like just reduce the dose of the statin? You discontinue it altogether, right? So again, be careful with this. Try to identify the cause. Was it a drug interaction? Was it due to the dose being too high? Are they just kind of, you know, the older the patient is, the more likely our disease issues with the high dose statins. These are things you want to be really careful of uh, when watching this. And that'll be important when we talk about the guideline recommendations later on. So contraindications. Um, Hepatic disease, obviously, they already have their LTs bumped because of cirrhosis or due to whatever. Um, this would not be a good class of medications to put them on. Pregnancy is also another thing. You really don't want to mess with lipid formation in a developing fetus because, as I mentioned, a lot of those triglycerides go off to eventually form your cell layers, right? Your lipid bilayers for your cells. Do you think a fetus needs a lot of those? Probably, right? So again, this is going to be contraindicated in pregnancy. You do not want to um, use these. And then we're also going to see that the relative contraindications are typically due to drug interactions with other concomitant medications. So uh, don't memorize that list specifically. I'm just giving you examples of other things that could cause levels of these statins to rise, specifically through things like CYP3A4 inhibition, right? So again, anything that will inhibit CYP3A4 is going to be affecting things like your atorvastatin, simvastatin, several other ones as well. Those are the two more of the common ones you're going to run into in terms of CYP3A4 inhibition. But again, things like grapefruit juice can inhibit CYP3A4 and can lead to higher levels of those drugs, right? And what did I mention about grapefruit juice in elderly patients? They love it, right? Why? It's the only thing that's still stimulating those taste buds after a while. Like everything else just tastes bland to them, but grapefruit juice still tastes great. So um, you'd have to be really careful mixing those two together. Make sure to educate, not to, to combine those two. Um, now, would this affect something like rosuvastatin? No, right? Because again, it was not really going through that pathway. So it could be a safe alternative. Pravastatin might be a safe alternative as well, right? Because it avoids a lot of these interactions. <clears throat> so again, you're going to find that in terms of their place in therapy, these are going to be the most efficacious and best tolerated out of all the ones we're going to talk about today. And in fact, uh, for LDL lowering effects, they are going to be first line. Because of all the pleiotropic effects, they're just first line in general. So anyone with a history of cardiovascular disease, previous MI, CHF, if they have a risk for cardiovascular disease, statins are going to be the drugs to put them on, right? It's almost like a candidate just to put in the, the water supply just because everyone could probably benefit from some statin use. Um, even like you talked about making like over the counter just to increase access. Um, but again, these are going to be your kind of go-to gold standard kind of meds, okay? Okay, so what are some other meds we could use? Perhaps like what if maybe a statin wasn't really good enough to get their LDLs under control on their own? Um, what are some other things we could also add to help with that, right? Or maybe alternatives if they are not good candidates for statins, what else could they use? So first off, we're going to have azetamide, which is our cholesterol absorption inhibitor. Here you can see, see that azetamide basically works on directly on the intestinal mucosa to prevent that absorption of fatty acids and triglycerides and all those things from getting absorbed from the intestine. So what happens to them if they don't get absorbed there? Eliminate through the feces, right? So you don't really have to worry about the absorption of those products at that point. So do you think it would work synergistically with a statin? Yeah, because one, it blocks the uptake of cholesterol from the intestine, and then the other one that could work on cholesterol uh, production in the, or in the liver. So again, these can work synergistically together based off their mechanisms, right? And so by having less delivered cholesterol to the liver, you're going to also cause that le intracellular levels of cholesterol to go down, which what does that do to the LDL receptor expression on the hepatocytes? It's going to go up, right? So, um, and again, also you can see overall effects, you know, cholesterol content of atherogenic particles like LDL are going to go down. These are all really good things here. Um, the also, the other benefit here is that azetamide itself gets uh, absorbed enterohepatically. So it gets eliminated through the bile and it gets reabsorbed from the intestine as well. So it kind of helps to limit sort of systemic effects from the drug itself. Um, it also kind of extends the half-life of the drug as well, right? So that way it doesn't just doesn't get eliminated through the liver and, and through the kidneys. It gets sent out through the bile, gets reabsorbed, and that helps to make it last longer. So, and frequently you'll see it in combination with something like simvastatin. So like Vitorin is a combination of azetamide plus uh, simvastatin. So again, this is going to provide modest benefits on the LDL, but that's mainly the only thing it's going to do. You would never or very rarely ever see a patient just on azetamide by itself. This is typically going to be an add-on medication for the majority of patients. Okay. 
And so really the biggest thing you're going to find are just GI related side effects, not really a whole lot of issues from that standpoint. Um, you may be seeing some increase in LLTs, but it's usually in combination with statins are already at risk for causing that anyway. So those are kind of the biggest risks you think about. And then these will interact with other lipid lowering agents as well, right? So for instance, um, we'll talk about our fibric acid derivatives a little bit later on. These also affect the biliary tract and can increase your risk for things like cholelithiasis, right? It can also increase your risk for things like myopathies potentially. Um, so those are the things you'd want to consider there. Um, that's probably like the biggest drug interaction you're drawing into if you mix this with the fibrate, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, next, the fibric acid derivatives, otherwise just known as the fibrates. So here we have three agents here. There's gemfibrozil, phenofibrate, and bezofibrate, the three agents in this group. And so these are working through a, a different mechanism than what we've seen already uh, in terms of uh, handling cholesterol. So what this actually does is it works on this nuclear transcription factor called PPAR alpha. So this actually activates PPAR alpha and will increase fatty acid oxidation. And what this does is by increasing the oxidation of fatty acids, this helps to lower uh, the secretion of VLDL particles, okay? So lowering VLDL particles means triglycerides are going to go down. down, good. And you also end up seeing increases in HDL because you see more expression of this ApoA1. So the primary benefit of fibrates is not necessarily getting your LDL down so much, but it's to get your triglycerides down and get your HDLs up. Because you may have patients whose cholesterol doesn't look too bad, but maybe their HDL is like, you know, say 25 or 30 or something. And typically you want it above what? Depends on the patient, right? But maybe at least above 40, maybe 50 or 60, depending on the case there. So this could be helpful in getting the HDLs up, depending on, on the, how the patient's presenting. And so here you can see, you know, total cholesterol, which is usually a combination of your VLDLs, LDLs, and, and HDLs, um, down about 15%. But the main benefit you're going to get is getting that HDL up and getting those triglycerides down, okay? This will work better on those two components than, say, a statin would. Um, so again, maybe use as an add-on, but or it could be used if maybe a patient has, say, a congenital issue which causes them to have really high triglycerides. So if some patients have a familial hypertriglyceridemia, this may be a really good medication for them to help get those triglycerides down specifically, right? Biggest effects you're gonna see is mainly gonna just be abdominal effects, a lot of nausea, diarrhea you can see with this. Um, and again, cholelithiasis is gonna be another big risk, especially if you mix it with something like azetamide, something's gonna get that enteropathic recirculation going. Um, and obviously myopathy is being a risk, especially if you add it onto what else? So what other drug class we just talked about can cause myopathies? Statins as well, right? So again, most of the side effects you're gonna see here tend to be exacerbated when combining these drugs together. Fortunately, though, nowadays, since we're not really focused quite so much on just the number, in terms of the LDL goal, we're more focused on the risk factors and getting them on a certain um, you know, intensity of statin, as we'll see a little bit later on. Um, you're seeing combination of these drugs less and less frequently, and you may see this, again, just used for, say, something like just isolated hypertriglyceridemia. Um, this would be another one you don't want to use it in pregnancy. You would definitely not want to use it if they have existing gallbladder disease, because this actually can worsen that cholelithiasis. So that's another thing you want to avoid that. Uh, in terms of drug interactions, you can see that it certainly can exacerbate the side effects of our statins. We mentioned azetamide can also cause cholelithiasis. Another class of drugs we'll talk about in a minute is called the bile acid sequestrants. That also can worsen cholelithiasis. Those are the biggest risks you can see with that. And in some cases, it can actually worsen the anticoagulant effects of warfarin. We've talked about warfarin already. Yes? We covered those drugs. Anticoagulants, have we talked about that yet? Talk about that later. Okay, we'll talk about warfarin later, but warfarin... I probably at least mentioned in passing. Anyone know what kind of drug that is? The blood thinner. Yeah, yeah. It basically, you stopped your liver from producing clotting factors, or a lot of clotting factors, and so you can see some increased effect out of that. So bleeding may be a risk you could see potentially. But we'll get into more detail on that when we get to the anti-coag drugs. Okay. So as I mentioned, fibrates. The main place you're going to see this in is going to be a primary triglyceride, hypertriglyceridemia. And if you have a level say greater than a thousand, now normal triglyceride level should be around what? Like 100, maybe 150, somewhere around there. But, you know, so for some patients that have this genetic predisposition to having high, really high levels, fibrates are going to be good for those patients there. Or if they have just like a low HDL, you could do this to bump them up additionally. Uh, next, we have our bile acid sequestrants or the resins. Anyone know what these drugs do? What's in the name? 
Yeah. Okay, what's your question? <laughs> you got to answer my question first, and then I'll answer your question. Ask the question. What does a bile ask us a question to? It sequesters <laughs> bile acids, right? It's right in the name. Oh, right. But the mechanism is, I don't know what the end effect is. I don't know what the mechanism is. Right? How does it lower the LDL? It's right in the name, right? Sequesters bile acids. Anyway, what's your question? I'm just stuck on my question. I just don't want to forget. Okay. Oh, I got you. You're so focused, laser focused on your question. So, you know, I, forget this other stuff. Perfect, I knew it. Got it. So, um, maxing it up to our fibrates, mm -hmm. their side effect is going to be the HMG CoA reductase inhibitor, but that, isn't that what the statin is? So, how is it a side effect? If it's well, interact with the statin to increase the risk for things like your myopathies, right? So, it's like a double, like you're taking two, like basically the same kind of thing. Right? Yeah, they can both do the same thing, right? So, you can see increased risk for it, right? So, it's, uh, oh, it's that's optional. You could combine the two, but just know that those that risk is going to be increased, right? But nowadays, you're starting to see less and less use of these combos because we've now focused more on just getting a patient on the most intense dose of statin as possible. And it'll be more clear when we get into the guidelines uh, a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, so you're seeing less and less combinations, but it would be the risk there is that you could see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So getting back to the, the resins here, so the bile acid sequestrants are going to sequester bile acids in the GI tract, and so what does that do to my absorption of cholesterol? Decreases it, right, because they're all being bound up in the GI tract. So remember, the bile resins, the bile acids, I should say, are made where? In the liver, and they get sent out through, stored in the gallbladder, and get sent out through the biliary tract, right? So they get sent out, and again, their purpose is to do what? They emulsify or they break down fat particles into smaller bits so we can absorb them to make those chylomicrons. So, but they also get reabsorbed as well, right? They get reabsorbed and taken back into the, uh, the liver where they can then be um, sent out again. By binding those up and preventing them from being reabsorbed, what does that do to the intracellular cholesterol level in the liver? If they can't be recycled, levels go down, right? So again, you're going to see similar effects like just like with the zetamib you're blocking absorption of those fat particles here we're actually blocking recycling of the bile acids uh, specifically here okay the benefit with these drugs is that they have no absorption whatsoever they work specifically in the gi tract and so who might that be a benefit in who what kind of patients do you want to have very minimal drug exposure to children potentially who else pregnancy absolutely so these might actually be the drug of choice for patients who are pregnant or maybe small children where you may want to have as little effect on or systemic drug effect as possible, right? Um, but again, by decreasing the amount of bile acids you're reabsorbing, the liver says, well, I need to make more bile acids. That uses up cholesterol, that then gets sent out, and then you bind those up again, and there you go, right? So that's the, kind of the cycle we're going to see there. So overall, you're reducing LDL concentrations because since the liver says, I need more cholesterol, it's going to be sending out more LDL receptors to get it out of the bloodstream, okay? So basically, this is what this is saying here. Um, again, not going to be absorbed systemically. So very good for those patients there, pregnancy, children. It's great. However, what do you think is the main side effect you're going to see is? GI side effects. Absolutely. So you're going to see a lot of cramping. You're going to see a lot of uh, flatulence potentially. You're going to see a lot of stomach issues associated with GI tract issues here. The three bilasses of questions we have is going to be cholestyramine, cholestopol, and cholecephalum. Those are the three main ones you're going to run into. Okay. Now, most of these either come as very big kind of bulky powders or tablets, right? And so some of them can be quite grainy. So imagine in terms of uh, um, tolerability with the patient, what do you think that's going to be like? Yeah, they may not want to take it, right? Because again, texture can really be a big problem. So imagine you have to mix this into water and if it tastes really bad or if it's really gritty, patients may not really like that. And so compliance can be an issue with some of these. That's one thing you do at least want to note. Um, and again, the only additional benefit of increasing the dose is you're just going to see more GI side effects. So that's really um, limited utility. And again, this is probably the weakest out of the bunch of getting LDL down, but this is the only class that really has the benefit of not directly interfering with the patient's body because they get they don't get absorbed, right? Usually we'll actually mix the stuff in like a pulpy drink 
something like some orange juice or something um, in order to mask the taste. That can sometimes help with the tolerability. Um, and they want to take it within an hour of a meal. Now, why do you think that is? Well, when are you sending out the most bile acids? During a meal, right? Because your body is detecting, hey, there's some fats here I need to break down. Let me go ahead and send out the bile acids. It will help stimulate the gallbladder, right? So when you're sending out those bile acids, when you want to bind them up, so that's why you want to take within an hour of a meal. Now, you're also going to find in terms of drug interactions, this will bind up a lot of other drugs in the GI tract. So you have to separate these out. So either take your other medications an hour before you take these, or you got to wait three or four hours after you take the bile acids sequester to take those other meds. Okay. So timing can be important in these because if this is binding up all your medications, then that's obviously not going to be very good from a compliance standpoint either, right? So GI effects, bloating, flatulence, fullness, constipation, nausea. What are similar side effects of pregnancy? Bloating, flatulence, fullness, constipation. Right? So again, they say, oh, it's really good for pregnant patients, but if you're pregnant, you probably don't want any more of these symptoms than you have to. So um, again, not great from a compliance standpoint. Usually you're kind of weighing the risk versus benefits for those patients. Like, do they really need treatment during that time? Who can say, right? Um, so it's going to be on a very much on a case-by-case -case sort of basis there. You also want to worry about things like malabsorption of vitamins A, D, E, and K. Why do you think that is? Well, vitamin A, D, E, and K, those are water soluble or are they fat soluble? Those are your fat soluble vitamins, right? So again, if the fat soluble vitamins can be absorbed through that fat that you're normally absorbing, then that could be a problem too, right? They're being bound up um, with those bile acids. So because of that, you can see um, depreciating levels of A, D, E, and K. Folic acid also can be inhibited. Its absorption can be inhibited as well. Folic acid is really important for pregnancy. Why is that? For instance, like, yeah, brain development, neural tube defects can occur there, right? So those are all things you want to consider, right? Um, the other big contraindication of using this is if you already have high triglyceride levels, this can actually increase that. Because basically it kind of stimulates the liver to produce more VLDL particles. So if you already have hypertriglyceridemia, this is going to worsen that. So this would be one thing you want to know uh, with this class of drugs here, okay? Have a question? Because it can still get LDL counts down. Yep, so it still has uh, good effects on LDL, but triglycerides are going to be taking a hit there. Okay. Um, again, a lot of other drugs are going to bind up with uh, the bile acid sequestration, so that's why you have to separate them out. Either one hour before, four hours after is going to be the kind of the time uh, range there. Okay. Doesn't mention absolute contraindications that they have triglyceride levels greater than say in 400. You don't want to use these medications here. Relative would be if they have you know kind of moderately high triglycerides. Again, this could have maybe no effects, but it more than likely it's going to increase them to some degree. So again, safest in terms of you're not going to see any rhabdo with this, you're not going to see any liver disease with this, but certainly poorly tolerated, probably going to be the least compliant out of the whole bunch here, um, but maybe using conjunction with the statin if you need some additional benefit to get the LDL down potentially. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know if it's specifically indicated for that. There are some kind of other ancillary uses for the bile acid sequestrants I've seen uh, some patients on, but I don't know if it's directly indicated for that. I have to double check. <coughs> or you could tell us if you want to go do some research. No idea. no idea? Where would you find that information out? Up to date. Up to date, absolutely. So you can look it up today. Yes, ma'am. You getting what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the one. You, um, so that was um, an agent called, Ally was the brand name. The uh, the generic is escaping me because I don't I never see it used all too often. Do you know? No, my question was for Ally. Yeah. I know that one of the main side effects is urinal leakage. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's much less so. So in, it, this is mainly just affecting the bile acids, not necessarily like all fat absorption. So because it's more, and, and things like azetamide wouldn't do this either, right? So you may cause some diarrhea, but it's not going to be as severe as like blocking all fat absorption altogether. So all that's staying in the GI tract. And so they would say like, make sure you bring like an extra pair of like dark pants with you because... <laughs> It's that bad, yeah. So the, the fecal incontinence can be really, really severe with that one, um, and which is why the tolerability of it was notably poor, right? Um, it's like, yeah, you get little fat absorption, but it's all it's got to come out one way or the other. So, um, 
anyway, yeah, so not, not quite what we're talking about here. Certainly can maybe see some, some minor variations of that, but quite minor in comparison to something like Ally would do, yeah. Anyway, um, another group here is going to be niacin. So this is actually a B-complex vitamin, so it's actually a derivative of some of the other B-complex vitamins we have there. And uh, it will get converted over into nicotinic acid. And so other forms are called like niacinamide. However, if you ever see a product called nicotinamide, that's actually not as effective as an anti-lipemic agent. So um, you'll frequently see uh, niacin available as like a dietary supplement. There's also some prescription-only products as well that are basically derived from the same thing. So, like I said, you can go to the Walmart or GNC or anywhere you can find nice and supplements. Um, they can also be used as sort of an over-the-counter variety like this to help uh, with some of your cholesterol um, issues. Different varieties you're going to find. There's immediate uh, release kind. There's going to be some side effects associated with that um, versus um, the extended release product, which is more often seen from a prescription standpoint. Um, whenever using a dietary supplement, that was kind of the things you have to know. Like, say your patient wanted to try using niacin as a dietary supplement. What are some things you might counsel them on about the inherent nature of dietary supplements? Hmm? We'll talk about flushing in a minute. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. What about just dietary supplements in general? You tell them, like, ah, those they don't even work. They're they're useless. You don't tell them that, right? So they're not regulated through the FDA, right? So just because they say something on the bottles in there does not necessarily mean it is in there, okay? The only time the FDA gets involved with a dietary supplement is if there are reports of side effects or uh, organ damage or anything like that. They will come in and then potentially investigate, maybe take them off the market. But they can't say anything in terms of, you know, is the drug efficacious? The FDA doesn't know because they don't investigate that sort of thing, right? They are, yeah, it's a little bit more the Wild West, right? They're, they may have some, like, you know, so that's why, you know, they can't enforce certain good manufacturing practices like you would for, like, an FDA-regulated product. So that's why I say if you find a product you like, like, make sure you're buying the same one. Make sure, you know, you don't buy it, like, some discount 25-cent variety of niacin. It may not be, sometimes you get what you pay for, right? And so this is something to let the patients know that, hey, make sure you're getting a consistent product, one that has a good reputation, because again, we can't guarantee that, you know, if I have a niacin product from the FDA that says 100 milligrams, I know that's 100 milligrams of niacin. If you get it from Walgreens or wherever, anywhere else, you, you can't guarantee that. That's the basic thing to say. Do, do herbal supplements still work? Do they still do stuff? 100%, right? They can kill people potentially, right? They can be so effective. So just be aware of that. Again, if a patient wants to try one of these as sort of a natural alternative, maybe something worth trying, right? You never know, right? That's why you'd want to at least counsel them about it. Um, you don't, you want to have an open mind about these sort of things and they'll just shut them out completely because if you shut them out completely about it, what do they start to do? They shut you out completely at that point. And they're like, well, this person doesn't even know what they're talking about. I'm not even going to take what they try to give me. Right. So again, it's important to have a good, respectful conversation about these and keep an open mind uh, about some of these things as well. Anyway, so nice man is the main one we're going to see here. Use the extended release part is actually really important uh, for these, and it's actually kind of harder to find immediate release nice. And, and we'll talk about the issues with that in a moment. Basically, what you're finding, oh yes, sir. Yeah, um, it has to do with the, the characteristics of it. So. Um, you're going to get similar activities out of both. Uh, it's just having to do with how they're actually, um, the doses forms themselves, how they actually release the medication. It's a little different in terms of um, how they're actually manufactured, essentially. But essentially, they're both going to be having similar effects to help produce those side effects, as we'll see. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Anyway, the, the mechanism here, specifically what they're going to do, is these actually will decrease fatty acid oxidation um, coming out of the adipose tissue. So by decreasing fatty acids coming from adipose tissue, you decrease the amount of triglycerides being synthesized in the liver, thus VLDL levels go down, right? Uh, and then you're also going to find downstream of that, HDL levels should go up. So this acts very similar to what other class of drugs we just mentioned. The fibrates, right? So think about fibrates and niacin having similar effects. So I have some ability to drop LDL, but not nearly as much as, say, something like the statins would. But these are good to get triglycerides down and to get HDL up. Those are the main things you're going to see with fibrates and with niacin, okay? So again, less mobilizations of fatty acids coming from the adipose tissue means less triglyceride synthesis in the hepatocyte, meaning you're going to have less VLDL secretion here. Yes, sir? I've not found any consistent effects in terms of niacin um, affecting weight loss necessarily. There may be some studies out there, but I don't know of any myself. Yeah. Um, 
And again, downstream of this, you're going to see increased HDL concentrations, which are obviously we know to be protective for our patients, right? So um, you see here the, the dosing. Um, I'm not going to quiz you specifically on the dosing, but again, the doses can range pretty widely depending on how much of effect you're really looking for there. Um, the extended release niacin, though, is beneficial because one, they're only taking it one time a day, which is good. It's also going to mitigate some of the side effects you're going to be seeing with those. Um, with niacin. The main side effect you're going to see with niacin is the fact that it increases prostaglandin synthesis. Now we've talked about prostaglandin synthesis before. What drugs affected that? Prostaglandin. NSAIDs. NSAIDs, right? NSAIDs, aspirin affected prostaglandin synthesis. That'll be important in a second. But niacin itself causes um, significant cutaneous flushing because it is synthesizing prostaglandins. It causes vasodilation, it causes flushing, you feel hot, you get sweaty, nausea vomiting is very frequently seen with that. And we can mitigate that though by giving aspirin with it. And why does that make sense? Because aspirin does what to prostaglandin synthesis? Decreases it, right? So that's why they recommend taking aspirin before you take immediate release niacin. Now this is in, uh, extremely uh, mitigated by using extended release preparation by slowly doling it out throughout the day, you have to mitigate that pretty pretty significantly, okay? Um, actually, I had one time, I had some friends who were in pharmacy school along with me at the same time. We were, uh, they were actually at a different rotation than I was at the time. They were in a, a family practice clinic, and it was a fairly slow clinic, so they got bored one day. And so they said, well, let's try this immediate release nice, and, and let's see how bad this flushing really is. It was really bad. Um, I was picking one of them up to take them back home. After the rotation, they got in the car and basically they were just red from head to toe. Like they were completely sunburned. They had been vomiting like five minutes before that. They were sweating profusely and they basically just like drank a bunch of water, went to bed for like 18 hours and then got back up. Like, so it was, it was terrible, right? Had they taken aspirin beforehand, they could have mitigated that, okay? Also, don't just use drugs just for fun, right? That's, uh, you get bad effects like that. Anywho. Um, so of course, gastrointestinal discomfort is going to really be the biggest thing you're going to see with these. Uh, and then with larger doses, potentially you can see things like increases in uric acid levels, which may be a problem for patients with yeah. gout potentially, right? Um, and some issues if you have a diabetic patient, they have decreased glucose tolerance, meaning their levels could potentially rise there, okay? In terms of contraindications, they have liver disease already, this can exacerbate that, so I'd avoid it for those patients there. And then patients, you know, things like peptic ulcer disease, history of gout, diabetes, this would be a relative contraindication. But again, some patients are going to want to try this because it's an herbal supplement, it's a natural variety, you know, they may want to try this before they move over to prescription medications. Obviously, it's not going to be nearly as beneficial as something like statin would be overall, okay? And again, you can see some issues here. Um, ethanol or ETOH that can actually worsen some of the flushing effects you can see with that, so I'd be uh, wary of that, not drinking with, taking their niacin. And, and then obviously we know this can worsen some of their um, uh, statins and whatnot, can worsen the, the hepatotoxicity effects. Okay, so what is used for? Basically, it's going to be used more for patients with low HDLs or high triglycerides. This can be useful in combination, um, or by itself, or in combination with some other uh, therapies there. And again, looking at by using combination, say something like lovastatin and niacin, you end up getting pretty good effects on all three components here. Um, so again, there could be some synergistic benefits, but of course, side effects could be worse potentially. Okay, so this is the newest class of. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Is it, it is regulated if it's a prescription, but it's not if it's a supplement? Right. So if it's a prescription based product that you know, says Rx on it, that means it has been approved by the FDA for sale. It means that the company has to show they follow certain standards for manufacturing, they have to show that their drug actually has in it what it says is in it, um, etc. If it's a herbal supplement or dietary supplement, then the FDA has not approved that use. Also, there are other things. So for instance, um, there are certain issues in terms of what they can claim on the bottle, right? So, for instance, they can't say, well, lower your LDL cholesterol because they're actually like, treating something then. They can say, like, promotes good cardiovascular health. So what they can say on the bottles and what they can say in the advertising is pretty tightly regulated. That's a big reason why a lot of those um, dietary supplements get removed because they'll make claims like that, but this will help fix your diabetes, and then or this will stop cancer, and then the FDA will come in and be like, mm, you can't say that, and they'll take them off the market. Um, so advertising is a really big issue with dietary supplements as well. So some are, some are, so like Centrum probably would fit under that classification there, right? 
Um, it depends. You have to look at the labeling on the bottle to see specifically what it says. Uh, but there's certainly ones that are prescription only, like certain um, prenatal vitamins and things like that. But um, yeah. But you know, like I said, like it's not to say that you know everything is like out of the back of someone's van on the side of the road that you're buying this stuff. Like, um, if you're getting a, a reputable product, like Centrum's been around for a long time, they probably have pretty good products, right? So, anyway. So this is the yes, sir. I was just gonna add that I know a lot of uh, supplement companies they start adding like third-party, um, I think it's like mass spectrometry. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so again, a lot of those companies may want to do that because that actually shows some veracity to what they're claiming is in them for sure. Um, I know a lot of, actually it's kind of tangentially related, uh, I know a lot of companies selling, for instance, like uh, medicinal marijuana products, like CBD products, they try to add a lot of that stuff like that too to show like, look, this is actually what we say is in here based off those results. Um, it was interesting, though, I found that there's one company, or at least one company that was actually using studies from other groups and they're applying to theirs and basically just like plagiarizing a little bit. So again, there's some issues with that. But anyway, yes, that, that can be useful to try to show that, hey, this is actually a legit product for sure. Um, anyway, so this is the newest class of uh, anti-lipemic agents. It's called the PCSK9 inhibitors. These are gonna be monoclonal antibodies. So already, what do you know is the potential side effect? Hmm? Well, you know it has to be given via injection. Anaphylaxis is gonna be a risk, right? Just like we talked about with Zolair, right? What's the big risk with Zolair? The monoclonal antibody, it's a foreign protein, risk for anaphylaxis, all the, always, right? And because it's a protein, can I give this orally? No, because no, the stomach will chew it up just like it does any other protein. So these are going to be monoclonal antibodies. These are going to be injectable products only. What do you think about the cost of these agents? Expensive, right? And because of the newest ones, they're still brand only. These are going to be expensive. These are really only going to be used as add-on therapy, not used by itself for the majority of patients, okay? So I have alirocumab, we have evilocumab. Basically what these are going to do is they uh, basically will bind up their antibodies. They bind up this protein called PCSK9. And basically what they do is PCSK9 normally causes metabolism and processing of LDL receptors in the hepatocytes. So if I bind that up, if I use an antibody to prevent that protein from working, what do you think happens to LDL receptor concentration? It increases dramatically. You have a lot more LDL receptors sitting there on the hepatocyte. So what does that do to the LDL levels in the blood? drops it significantly. In fact, there were some cases during clinical trials where people's LDL concentrations were undetectable. Pretty good, right? I don't, I don't know if that actually causes any problems for patients, but that was some, one of the side effects they saw, side effects, so to speak, is actually had completely undetectable LDL concentrations. Um, so again, very effective what it does, but again, only going to be used as an add-on agent. Uh, Anaphylaxis is going to be the biggest risk you worry about with that. Okay, and again, this table is nice here. The numbers aren't specific to memorize, but kind of get the good trends in terms of what these different agents are going to be doing here. So, for instance, statins we know are going to be for majority of patients your first line therapy here, but know that things like you know nicotinic acid and the fibrates are good at getting triglycerides down and HDL up. Know that the resins can cause triglycerides to do what? go up potentially, right? So those are the things you want to kind of take away from these things, kind of the big takeaway issues here and what they're going to do for the cholesterol levels. Now, again, how do you actually get your total cholesterol amount? Again, we measure triglycerides in, in the blood. That's what shows up on your lipid panel. That's sort of an indirect measure of your VLDL. Um, and before, what we used to do in terms of treatment is we were trying to shoot for certain goals, right? So we wanted LDL down less than 100 optimally. We want HDL up greater than 60. You know, <laughs> Nowadays, we're getting away from that. Those are kind of the old guidelines. And nowadays, we're looking to try to mitigate the, the cardiovascular risk that the patient has, even if they don't have a history of a heart attack or something like that. We want to go ahead and try to make sure that we are looking at their potential for risk in the next upcoming 10 years or so, and then making sure we're treating accordingly based off of that. And so basically what changes have occurred is that now we're focusing on either placing patients as first-line therapy on either moderate or high-intensity statin therapy. I'll show you what that looks like in just a few moments in a table. Um, and they will decide what kind of statin therapy they get put on based off different risk categories. Okay? And again, we don't titrate to a certain LDL goal. We're really trying to get the most maximal dose of statin that they can be on. Okay? Now, you still measure your LDL concentrations. You still measure lipid panels because if I put, say, a patient on 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin, which is one of the most potent statins we have, and the LDL doesn't change, what does that probably indicate? 
probably not taking it, right? So we can use that to look for compliance, right? So if I put someone on 40 versus suicide, there better be some movement in their LDL, otherwise they just ain't taking it, right? So who are the main people that they found benefit from use of these statins? So it's going to be people with a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that angina, they have previous MI, things like that. If they have LDL greater than 190, if they have diabetes, say they're 40 to 75 years of age and they have either maybe normal up to elevated LDL concentrations and they don't have a history of ASCVD, or if they are without clinical ASCVD or diabetes but they have this LDL concentration and their risk is greater than 7.5% of having cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. Okay, so those are the four risk categories. So they have elevated LDLs, they have a history of atherosclerotic disease, they have a high risk of developing atherosclerotic disease at greater than 7.5%, or if they have diabetes and they're in that age range there. Those are the people that are going to benefit, right? And so basically when you're working with a patient, you kind of work them through the algorithm, right? You kind of find out what their risk factors are, which I had to calculate that in a moment. And then you kind of figure out, okay, well, where are they at? You know, are they at low risk? Are they at intermediate risk? And then you talk about things like, okay, well, what do we need to do in terms of therapy here? Obviously the first thing you should do with patients who are at risk is what? Weight loss. What else? Exercise. Diet. diet, right? So all the non-farm stuff you have to include for all these patients regardless, right? However, if they need that additional benefit or the risk is high enough, this is where you start to think about including their statins, right? So again, by adding on a moderate or high intensity statin, you're going to be able to help get those uh, levels to such where their risk for cardiovascular disease should, should decrease, right? And we know this because we've done huge studies, right? You ever, ever heard of like the Framingham Heart Study? It's huge. They've been doing that for decades and it's been done in thousands and thousands of people. And we know the, the benefits of using these statins in these patients to lower mortality, right? And again, don't memorize this entire chart here, but know who the main people are gonna benefit from statin therapy are. And again, we'll talk about how we can uh, work them through the process here. So for instance, every patient, if they have a history of ASCVD, are gonna get healthy lifestyle education, obviously. But let's say, you know, they are at a uh, higher risk, right? Um, very high risk for ASCVD. We can see here that high intensity statins are gonna be beneficial, right? For some patients, maybe we'll go a little bit lower intensity, or maybe they're over 75, and we know there are more risk for side effects, maybe we'll back them off a little bit as well and go with more moderate intensity therapy. Those are kind of the decisions you're gonna make for these patients here. But the main thing is to get them on statin therapy, and if they still can't get their LDLs under control, that's when you consider adding on another agent here, right? Or if they can't tolerate statins, maybe you switch over to a different agent potentially. But, you know, what are some things they look at to determine your risk for ASCVD? Well, obviously, gender plays a role, right? Who's more at risk? Guys, unfortunately, right? The older you are, the bigger your risk is. Um, you're looking at total cholesterol, HDL levels, systolic BP, you have diabetes, smoking. All these things are going to play a role. And, again, it's easy to look up a calculator online, right? So I don't, you don't know how to calculate this yourself. Plug it in online. It will give you a certain percentage of risk over the next 10 years. And if they're greater than 7.5%, they're going to benefit from those uh, statins, right? And so just to give you an idea, what we're looking at in terms of high versus moderate intensity statins, um, the two highest uh, potency agents you're going to find here are going to be rosuvastatin and atorvastatin, okay? Those are the two you're going to get most bang for your buck out of statin therapy here, okay? Moderate ones, you're going to find a lot more leeway there. And again, the dosing is not so important because you can look that up, but it's good to know which ones are kind of in your arsenal in terms of what you can use. Um, now again, which one's nice because it mitigates a lot of those drug interactions? Resuvastatin's going to be good, but again, if you had a patient who maybe couldn't afford it, atorvastatin's a good alternative. You just have to look for those drug, drug interactions that can occur there. Now what if a patient maybe was on, they, they had a good indication to be on, say, um, 20 milligrams of resuvastatin, but they got side effects from it. What do you do? Right, lowering the dose, right? So again, you put them on as high of a dose as they can tolerate. So they need to be on resuvastatin, back off the dose to see what they can tolerate there until maybe the LTs level out, they're not having the myalgias, etc. Because again, it's more important that they're on it rather than what specific dose you can get it to, okay? Make sense? Um, other things, remember to keep the drug interactions in mind, look for those side effects, um, and again, use a maximal tolerated dose that they can get to. It's kind of what we've already mentioned. So any questions for that section? That was quick, but again, I'm trying to get us back on track. So again, nine times out of ten, what are you going to put a patient on? Statins, Statins right? Uh, that's not a, that's not going to work. What can you use instead? All kinds of different options, right? You know that if a pregnant patient, what do you put them on? If I ask this a question or a resin, right? If they have high triglycerides, 
niacin, fibrate, right? So this is the kind of question I'll be asking for, like what's kind of indicated based off these specific patient um, circumstances, right? Okay, um, check the board real quick, see if there's any questions there. Uh, I think. Let's see, what's the time frame between taking aspirin before taking niacin? I'd probably like do maybe 30 minutes beforehand. I think it'd be reasonable. Yes, sir. Um, with the PCSK9 inhibitors, how often do you have to get the injection? Those, I actually have to double check. I'm not sure. I know some of the injectables you can do it like weekly, like some of the diabetes ones. I'd have to double check on that. Uh, potentially daily, though. Um, please be able to give different scenario. Oh, yeah, we already talked about that one. Okay, so any other questions we have? If not, I will see you guys next time.